So next up um, is Eleonora and Eleonora, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to get um, situated and then we will start the next session. Yeah, I am uh, ready to share. Okay. So um, I think that was a wonderful, wonderful opening session. And I'm very happy to say that we have another researcher, albeit one who is no longer working directly as a researcher, as our second plenary of the day. I think many of you will know Eleonora Prasani, who is now the first, I think, executive director of Archive, which is very exciting for, I think, pretty much certainly everybody in the physics world, but also everybody in the PID world. So um, we are looking forward, I'm looking forward very much, Eleonora, to hearing what you have to say, and I will hand over to you. Thank you, Alice. Um, let me share. And here you go. Yeah, so first of all, thanks uh, very much for the invitation to be part of uh, at this conference. Uh, uh, before joining Archive, uh, I was uh, still working in uh, publishing, and I saw uh, this conference appearing in uh, various uh, uh, lists, and I never had a good reason uh, to participate, and it was always uh, kind of disappointing. So I'm really happy that now I, I have a good reason, and I am uh, here to, to talk about Archive. And uh, yeah, so... So the, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, All PIDs are equal, but some are more equal than others. And, uh, uh, and I, I could also have a different title for this. So that would be uh, that uh, there is more than a number to a PID. So in, in both, uh, for, for both uh, perspective, uh, I think that uh, what I'm trying to, to present uh, uh, here in this uh, presentation is that uh, um, there are many ways to create a uh, a PID, uh, but then there are only few ways uh, to make it uh, really uh, useful for the entire community. So that's uh, that's about it. So first, I would like to um, introduce uh, to all of you about uh, Archive. Uh, as uh, Alice said, most likely those of you that have been working in physics uh, or around physics uh, have uh, heard of it. But now Archive is uh, expanding a little bit beyond physics, so um, I would like to introduce it to everyone. So uh, from um, a global perspective, uh, we are, uh, so Archive is a, is a repository. We are uh, receiving articles, we are putting in them online within 24 hours, uh, and they are shared uh, um, freely to, to every researcher that can uh, read them from anywhere in the world. Uh, and we receive papers from uh, almost every country in the world. Uh, we still have the majority of our submissions coming from the United States, but uh, as the years go by, uh, it becomes more and more global, uh, which is a, a great pride. We also uh, are more than just a small organization. We work um, with a, a large group of volunteers. So we have uh, two advisory boards, uh, one that is more focused on science, uh, one that is more focused uh, on uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, policy around publishing and uh, funding and things like that. Uh, we have a subject advisory committee, we, which means that for every subject that we discuss in, uh, in archive, uh, there is a, a committee that uh, uh, takes care of uh, the, uh, the quality and the content that appears in, uh, in, the, in those sections. And we have uh, 185 moderators uh, that are working every day to go through all the papers uh, that are submitted to, to archive. Uh, we also exist uh, thanks uh, to, a large, uh, uh, to a large network of members. We have uh, 129 libraries and institutions all around the world that support us. And in particular, we have also have uh, five consortia that represent uh, 125 libraries. So basically it's uh, almost 300 uh, uh, libraries around the world that uh, are really uh, supporting archive. And we also have six uh, professional societies. And um, yeah, so archive has a, a long history. Uh, we uh, exist uh, since uh, 30 years. In fact, in uh, 2021, during the summer, we will be celebrating our 30th uh, birthday. So I'm uh, really excited about that. And in these uh, uh, three decades, uh, there's been uh, a lot of things happening. So first of all, the number of articles that we have, uh, I think is very significant. We have more than 1.1 million articles. So 
a lot of knowledge is uh, stored on uh, on archive and especially it is uh, uh, getting higher and higher every month so we have uh, uh, in 2000 uh, uh, 20, we got to a peak of uh, 16,000 uh, submissions per month, uh, and we expect it uh, to keep uh, growing uh, steadily. Uh, we, a lot of people are using archive. Uh, we get uh, about uh, 25 million downloads every month, uh, and we have about uh, 4.5 million uh, monthly active users. Uh, and as I was saying, we started with physics, uh, but in fact now we have seven sections, including computer science, mathematics, uh, quantitative biology and finance, uh, engineering. So it's definitely uh, expanding beyond the initial uh, scope. And here you can see how the, the number of monthly downloads of the PDFs we are hosting is increasing uh, uh, almost exponentially uh, in, the, in the years uh, and also the number of submissions uh, grows uh, uh, every month basically quite steadily but even if uh, we have uh, we are kind of old we can still fit well the uh, party feeling in uh, Pida Palooza I think uh, this is uh, one of my favorite tweets uh, that I found about archive which is uh, why <laughs> what is about the that bizarre five icon of archive it's a little bit like a, a rave party and a pirate ship and so uh yeah this is a, a symbol that has been with archive for for many years and it's kind of a, a funny funny thing that identifies us so the history is uh, not just about the number of article and the content but it's really also a history of uh, the pit of archive because uh, identifiers for the article hosting hosted an archive started in 1991 when archive started so initially the structure that was chosen to uh, to build the the pid was to focus on the uh, on on the topic so we would have the what it was called the archive like physics astrophysics and mathematics and so on uh, and then the subject class meaning the, the specific category, and then uh, the, the date with year, month, and number. And that worked uh, very well for a long while, until uh, 27, uh, 2007. But then uh, there were some uh, kind of headaches uh, that uh, appeared. Uh, so, for example, what happens when an article ch changes category? Before that, it was not really possible to change the category of an article because it was really kind of part of uh, its identity. Uh, then uh, it's also confusing when articles uh, belong to multiple categories, then uh, you would have a, a primary one, uh, but when people read the, the ID, it might be confused uh, as of uh, what this article is really about. Uh, it also uh, happens that uh, those uh, categories and sections in, in, uh, in archive through 30 years of history uh, change and evolve as a science uh, evolves as well. And so sometimes you need to split one uh, category into two, for example. And how do you do for all the articles that were uh, belonging to that category before? And also uh, people that are not uh, familiar with uh, the archive taxonomy might find uh, this construction uh, quite uh, confusing. And on top of that, uh, because of how the, uh, the number was built, uh, there was a, a limit, a, a, a limitation of uh, uh, 999 uh, uh, submissions per month so that uh, was um, because there were only three uh, digits at the end so so that was an excuse when uh, this uh, kind of uh, informal uh, threshold was hit there was a good excuse to address uh, all uh, these uh, other more important uh, uh, issues so uh, since april 2007 the uh, it was decided to change the format of the of the PID. Uh, it, uh, it has a, a prefix that is uh, just uh, archive, and then the rest is completely numerical. So <clears throat> you have uh, a year and month, and then a number, and then uh, a version, a number version. So uh, you would always have uh, two digits at the beginning uh, that uh, uh, display that gives you a, a hint of the year in which the, uh, the paper has been submitted uh, the month 
with two digits and then uh, a number and initially that number was uh, um, four digits but then uh, soon enough they realized uh, that uh, in fact archive is growing so much that the four digits was also starting to become really uh, uh, tight and so it was expanded to five digits and since it's a padded uh, uh, a zero padded sequence number it is relatively easy to add uh, a new digit and then at the end uh, you always have uh, the version information so if uh, we have uh, this uh, PID that has been working for so long and that uh, resolves uh, always very well to uh, our, our URL, why uh, would Archive decide to adopt uh, DOIs? So we have been considering this uh, for, for a long time and whether it would uh, make sense for, for Archive to join uh, the DOI world. And uh, this year, in uh, January uh, this, uh, 2021, uh, we became members of uh, DataSite. So that's a very exciting moment for us and I would like to kind of explain a little bit uh, the reasoning be behind why we made uh, this uh, choice. So uh, uh, for and the reason are two basically. One is that uh, as I was saying at the very beginning a PID is more than just a number. It's also what it comes together with it. So data site uh, provides uh, a very flexible but structured metadata schema that is understood by a large uh, uh, number of organizations and people around the world. And so um, it offers uh, a really uh, nice way for archive to expand the reach of our communication. And also uh, doing so, becoming a member of data site, uh, archive joins the entire ecosystem of uh, uh, scholarly publishing. So we become uh, really part uh, of everyone uh, of, 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 of the ecosystem together with other organizations such as ORCID, data site, Crossref, and so on. And we can communicate with each other, really talking the same language. So uh, the, the, the metadata schema of, uh, of data site uh, is uh, particularly important uh, for, for archive because it's flexible enough uh, that allows archive to both uh, uh, fit the present needs, the fact that uh, we host uh, both uh, preprint but also some version of records, uh, for example, and we have different types uh, of preprints, uh, so it's fle flexible enough uh, to accommodate that. Uh, but it also uh, allows us to think more about the future and uh, whether uh, archive wants to start uh, hosting different type of content. Uh, uh, there is always this possibility. So it really um, it really fits well our our vision for the future. Um, and in terms of joining the ecosystem, I think that the fact that the, met the, the metadata schema uh, supports uh, seamless integration with uh, all the other uh, PIDs such as ORCID, ROR, and so on, um, allows us to connect e each uh, uh, record of archive uh, with, the, with, with their authors, with their institutions, with their funding information, and so on. Also, uh, for now, everyone can uh, access archive data by using uh, archive uh, APIs, but once uh, we are completely part of a data site, uh, even people who have uh, and never really heard of archive can still benefit from accessing our data through the data site APIs. And uh, also there are uh, certain uh, realities uh, like certain aggregators, uh, linking services, uh, even some funders uh, that only accept uh, uh, articles that have a DOI with it. So they, their system is such uh, that you can only add uh, a DOI type of ID and so it uh, would be, yeah, if for now it has been problematic for in certain countries and for certain uh, authors to have their archive uh, uh, records being officially recognized. So uh, we hope that this will also address uh, this issue. But uh, DOI and archive IDs are actually best friends. They are not uh, uh, an alternative to each other in a way, but they can work together very well. So. Uh, usually when you think about a DOI, uh, the structure is, uh, uh, is very standard. You have uh, the, let's say, domain, the proxy uh, to resolve the URL. And then uh, the actual uh, PID is the prefix and the suffix. And the prefix is something that is uh, assigned to the, 
to the organization. So archive will have uh, its own prefix, but then uh, we can uh, basically build the suffix uh, the way we want. So in that sense, uh, it's very natural for us uh, to just continue using the, uh, the same format that we have been using for the archive ID. So uh, for example, uh, if uh, you have uh, an archive records, uh, this archive record would have uh, an ID that you can see here uh, in the first line. So it's archive, a column, and then a number. And this always resolves uh, to an archive uh, URL. So you build the URL in this standard way with the ID, the numerical ID at the end. And we can use this uh, uh, the same way to, to have a DOI. So we would have the URL, we would have uh, a prefix. Uh, here I just put one, two, three, four to give an idea, but uh, it's, uh, it's not real. Uh, so don't uh, think that this is uh, the archive prefix. Um, but then after that, we can add uh, the same uh, uh, type of, uh, of, of construction for the ID. And uh, again, uh, this is just something I, I put together for the presentation. So I'm not sure that it will look, like, look exactly like this. We might want to leave the word archive completely uh, out, uh, or uh, uh, we want, might want to use it the way I displayed here. So it's still work in progress, but this is uh, an idea of how it would look like. And then there would be a published DOI uh, that is uh, the version uh, of the same article that was published uh, in a peer-reviewed journal. And so it will be much easier to really uh, follow the history of a record uh, uh, from preprint uh, to the published version. There are yet uh, some uh, challenges, uh, even though uh, the construction itself uh, of the number is pretty easy. Uh, there are still some things that we need to think about. Uh, one is uh, about versioning. I think uh, that uh, uh, this is pretty straightforward, but it's still something that uh, one has to make a decision about. Uh, so we want to have uh, a new DOI for each version. So each uh, a version will have their DOI with uh, V1, V2, V3, so V4, and so on. But then we also want to have uh, a DOI that resolves uh, to the entire record so that it automatically goes goes to the latest uh, version of the article. So um, I assume that this is going to be the way we are going to move forward with that. And then the other aspect that is important to consider is the timing of DOI registration. Um, archive, as, a, yeah, as I said many times during this uh, presentation, has a very long history, but also has a, like, a, a very strong culture. So there's a... a um, the community within Archive relies uh, really uh, intensely on the timely delivery of Archive records uh, early in the morning. And this is both for researchers uh, who wake up in the morning and they expect uh, to see in their mailbox uh, the list uh, of uh, the newly published Archive uh, uh, articles, but also uh, other aggregators and search indexes uh, such as uh, NASA IDS, uh, um, inspire and so on that rely on archive, uh, providing them a daily feed that is very uh, timely uh, every day. So that uh, even having two hours delay in uh, registering the DOI could become a problem for this type of uh, service. But in fact, uh, as long as the URL resolves uh, using the archive ID, the DOI can resolve a couple of hours later and that would be okay. So this, again, uh, it's not uh, a problem. It's not something that uh, uh, we are worried about, but it's something that is important to, to understand when building uh, this, this, this project. Um, so in terms of uh, metadata, I think that uh, um, we really like uh, how uh, flexible the data site the metadata schema is. It starts uh, with a very simple uh, mand mandatory metadata properties uh, that it's something that uh, everyone uh, uh, should be able to provide. So it's very low bar entry bar. So that's uh, that's great. But it also uh, offers a lot of uh, uh, benefits from uh, additional metadata properties. Uh, and here I had a problem with the animation, <laughs> but it's okay. Um, so one is uh, the linking with author identifiers. We both have. Uh, uh, an archive author ID, and of course, uh, we want to have also the ORCID ID associated to each uh, 
record we want to have institution and funding information associated with each record leveraging ROR. We wanted to have a link to the published version through DOI. And then, of course, we also wanted to have a link to data and software uh, through DOI and maybe using other frameworks such as Scholex. And uh, um, in general, um, we can easily do that for new records, so for new submissions that are going to come in the future, because we could, uh, we could ask the authors to provide all this additional information upon submission. But then, of course, it's a little bit more tricky for all the record because then uh, we might need to do some uh, matching to understand uh, uh, who is who and what is what. So archive is part of the entire family now of uh, uh, scholarly publication. And this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, important from two, two perspectives, uh, uh, data delivery and compatibility. From uh, data delivery, I think uh, uh, it's it's really nice that people can access uh, archive data through data site without even knowing that archive exists or is a thing. Uh, we know that uh, through uh, data site uh, we can uh, have better entity linking, and uh, uh, also people that uh, do know archive and they are already using archive APIs, if they are already connecting with many other services. Uh, they will no longer need to use specific archive APIs, but they can uh, uh, use the same that they use for other delivery services. And then in terms of compatibility, I think that it's important that uh, we are supporting those funders or national organization that only accept uh, DOIs. We are looking forward to work with, uh, with organization that uh, right now only works with DOI. Code Ocean is one example. Uh, but there are many others. And uh, also the fact that we would use a metadata schema that is compatible with others makes it ma matching much easier. So we would be able to fill in the missing metadata or understand uh, uh, yeah, who is whom uh, more easily. So what to expect in the future? So we have a, a choice in front uh, of us, uh, what to do in this year, in 2021 or at least in the next uh, six months or so. We can start uh, with a very simple uh, MVP and uh, register DOIs only for new submission and fill the metadata only with minimal information and uh, uh, only what, the, what we have uh, currently available in, uh, in archive. We can go for a middle uh, of the road uh, in which uh, we still register DOIs only for new submission, but then we wait uh, uh, that archive has uh, a new submission interface that would allow for capturing more metadata types. Um, and then we would fill in uh, new records, but then uh, with a more complete uh, metadata. Or uh, we can do for a all or nothing solution where uh, we want to register both uh, old new submission and back files uh, kind of uh, all in a row um, and uh, start uh, with uh, have the submission interface ready to capture all the new metadata and also do the matching work that is needed to complete the metadata for older records. So um, I am just thinking that uh, this is a, a very good uh, crowd of people that could uh, help me make this decision. So I am hoping that uh, uh, the feedback for this presentation would also be which of these uh, solutions would be the most useful for the community and would provide the most benefit for everyone. So I think there is going to be a little poll about this. Uh, and, and that is uh, all for my presentation. This is my name, email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, everyone is uh, very welcome to uh, contact me. And uh, also I will be on the Slack for questions. Thank you so much, Eleanor. I'm gonna give people just a, a minute or so to take the poll. Um, and we have quite a quite a few questions. I don't think we're going to have time to get through all of them, but uh, let's see what we can um, get through. So um, the first question, if you don't mind me asking while, while people fill in the poll, um, yeah. have you considered other PID schemes, schemas? Uh, you mean uh, besides DOI or other? I, I assume so, yes. 
I think that the, the so we were actually very happy with our bid. Uh, it works uh, almost as as good as it can. You know, it resolves constantly for thirty years. It's extremely stable. So uh, we were really happy with that. What we were missing is uh, really be part of the community and uh, the the compatibility and integration with others. Uh, so right. for that, I think DOI was uh, the best uh, option for us. Uh, we consider both uh, Crossref and data site, and then eventually data site uh, as the additional flexibility for some repository that is not necessarily only a, a article repository. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question is, will you be assigning DOIs for the earliest preprints, the sort of 30 year old ones? Yeah, so I think that this is a part of the question in the polls, right? Like how important it is that we go back to the very early ones. So we can, I mean, of course, the, the metadata for the very early one will not be as good as the one, uh, the new ones, but we could at least assign a DOI. So that is a possibility, yes. I'm just looking back at the poll, it seems like by a fairly long way, the all or nothing route is preferred by this crowd. Uh, MVP has got very few votes and the middle road is sort of in Interesting. Between. So we've, not everybody's voted yet. We can take a quick peek right at the end of the session in a couple of minutes. But for now, it's looking like, I guess, you know, for, a, for a PID crowd, that probably makes sense, doesn't it? We're all uh, very keen on good metadata and doing the right thing. Um, OK, I now have another question, which is curious why Archive chose data site DOIs rather than Crossref. Yeah, so that is uh, what I uh, mentioned before. Uh, we uh, actually, so both organizations, I have to say, have given us uh, so much support. Uh, they helped us making the decision. They uh, created uh, an, a wall overview. Uh, of the benefits uh, for each uh, work together. It was uh, an amazing experience in general. Um, we decided to go to that aside, I think uh, really for, because archive uh, might be, so Crossref is really focused uh, on uh, on publishing. Uh, so it, uh, it also depends on the community we wanted to be part of in a way, the type of members uh, uh, that we share the experience with. So institutional repositories, uh, data repositories uh, are a little bit more similar in terms of the experience and the challenges they face uh, to archive uh, than a publisher might be. So in that sense, uh, uh, um, data site felt uh, uh, a more appropriate home for us. Okay, I'm just going to squeeze in one more quick question. Uh, there are a few others. So again, hopefully you can uh, check in in Slack and, and see if there's other um, things people want to ask. But the last question we'll ask here is, does Archive currently have metadata associated with papers and are ORCIDs or organization IDs required? Yeah, so uh, uh, yes and no. <laughs> so yes, we do have metadata associated with each record. Um, it's uh, not uh, super well structured because it's a uh, metadata that has a kind of uh, built uh, uh, during the years. So this, uh, this is going to be a good opportunity for us uh, to uh, create uh, a, more, a better, more structured metadata schema. But we do have metadata already. We are capturing this. Uh, uh, we are not, we are, so authors can associate their uh, ORCID to their user profile. So we have uh, the connection between uh, the, the author and ORCID, but it is not uh, at the record level. So this information will not, is not transmitted uh, as of now uh, with, with the article. So that is one of the things we want to, to do instead. Great, thank you. So quick peek at the poll and yes, still all or nothing is still by a long way the top favourite. So I think you at least have your answer from the PID community. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will put my camera on. Um, again, thank you so much, um, Eleonora, for a really fantastic start to, to our 24 hours of PID partying. Thank you very much to the close to 400 people who have been uh, with us for the start of, of this 24 hour PID party. We hope you'll stay with us. Uh, we're now gonna break away from the plenary and you have a choice of research projects with uh, Todd Carpenter, Fiona Murphy and Natasha Simons, putting the P in PIDs with John Shadaki and Jonathan Clark, or a Portuguese language introduction to PIDs, which I will not attempt to say in Portuguese because I will mangle it, but with uh, Ana Heredia. 
uh, and we will see you back here for the next plenary in a couple of hours time and enjoy thank you all so much thank you everyone bye